Good morning. My name is Robert Bergen. I'm chairman of the Church of Scotland Investors Trust, and it's my pleasure to welcome everyone who has joined this uh, update webinar this morning. Let's open with prayer. Dear Lord, maker of heaven and earth, we give you thanks for the many ways in which you have blessed your church, our congregation and congregations and us as individuals. This morning, as we focus our attention on the investments of our national church, its agencies and congregations, we pray that you will make each one of us aware of the importance of stewardship of the assets for which we have been given responsibility and guide us in the decisions which we have to make. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may know the song, What a Difference a Day Makes, 24 Little Hours. And it strikes me that this could be a motto for investors. Our last webinar took place on the 23rd of September last year. And that day proved to be quite a significant day for UK investment markets, as it was the day on which the Liz Trust government presented its mini budget which proved to have unintended and quite negative consequences for bond markets in particular. We didn't know this at the time of the webinar, but the impact on investors was significant. I believe there are no such planned announcements for today. However, as I said last year, nothing is certain. As you will hear shortly from our investment managers, investment markets have continued to be challenged in a number of ways in the last 12 months. We've seen inflation and interest rates rising to levels not seen for many years. And sadly, the ongoing war in the Ukraine continues to impact on global markets. One piece of positive news is that last year we were able to increase the income distributions for each of our three funds. And we anticipate that the distributions for the income and deposit funds for this year will also show an improvement on that distributed last year, with a similar amount of income being distributed for the growth fund. Because it trustees undertake regular reviews of the investment strategy and management of each of our three funds, and we take advice from independent external advisors. Over the last few months, we have reviewed our investment consultancy arrangements. This has resulted in the recent appointment of a new firm of investment consultants, and we will be working with them in the months ahead. You may be aware that the General Assembly in May approved the establishment of an ethical oversight committee, which has the aim of focusing on the theological and ethical background of what the church should be investing in, taking account of the complexities of the investment options which are available to our investment managers. The committee held its first meeting recently and the COSIT trustees look forward to participating in the work of this body going forward. Today is our annual opportunity to receive updates from the three managers managing our three funds. Each of our managers will make an initial presentation and then there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions. If you're watching this on Teams Live, I would suggest that you use the Q and A function on your screen and the messages will will appear at this end. We will deal with them after the managers have made their presentations. If you're watching online or watching a recording, then please send us an email to the same address that you received this uh, invitation from and we will get back to you with our answers as soon as we can. First of all, we're going to hear from the managers of our deposit fund. The deposit fund is intended for short term investment of cash and seeks to provide a competitive rate of interest while preserving nominal capital value. 
The fund is managed by Thomas Miller Investments, and I'm pleased to welcome Christopher Smith, who will make a presentation this morning. Welcome, Chris. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Chairman. Um, as uh, you said, uh, it's Thomas Miller Investments. Um, in fact, uh, Thomas Miller Investments, uh, we actually manage it through our Isle of Man company, which is uh, um, something we do with all our funds, in fact. Um, if we go to the next slide, it gives a little bit of history of the structure of um, Thomas Miller. Thomas Miller dates back to 1885. Our roots are in shipping and transport insurance. Uh, we manage shipping and transport insurance mutuals. In fact, we only have one outside shareholder, which is the UK P&I Club, which insures about 28% of all the world's ships. The rest of the company is actually owned by the employees or previous employees. And we have about 800 people in 18 locations around the world. And that is for us is very helpful because we get feedback exactly what's happening in different economies. Um, and it's not just something we've read in the press, it's just something on the ground. And that, that for us, we feel is extremely important. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, we're based in the Isle of Man and London. London obviously is very important to us, but the Isle of Man we, is because we can, a lot of the mutuals are actually offshore companies which have to be managed offshore. Um, we manage in total about 2.6 billion funds, we have 24 staff in total and about 10 investment professionals. Um, which is, you know, a, in a reasonable number of people to be looking after that sort of funds. So if we go to the next slide. Okay, these are the restrictions for the fund, um, which are set by the trustees. Um, obviously, they they decide who we can invest with and how much we can invest for each institution. Um, the maximum exposure to a single in institution was set at 20 million but because of the way the market's been working and fewer people are taking money that has been amended by uh from time to time by the trustees we can only invest up to 18 months although to be honest we only invest really up to about a year at the moment because no none of the institutions want to go as long as 18 months um, we have always maintained two million pounds on call. We actually converted that into a fixed term deposit so that we would have money coming up every month. So the, the two next two items, the two and the three million are actually combined and we have five million roughly every single month. Um, we have no more than five million the past 12 months. We don't have any at the moment. We have no more than 60% of the portfolio over six months and uh, we have we used to do forward contracts the bank, banks aren't interested in doing that at the moment that may come back so you know we might might look at that uh, just to go back to the 60 percent I think the importance there is we if we could ask the trustees for a larger amount but because of the size of the portfolio we want to try and keep money coming up every month and therefore at the moment the 60% is, is the correct level. If we just go to the next slide, at the end of August um, and, and the figure is the same today, we have the, the portfolio has actually risen to 101.5 million. Now it has been down uh, in, in the last 12 months or so to about 90 million but obviously contributions from uh, the other treasurers from the church itself has put it up. Now, the interesting thing, if you see the maturities here, normally it would not be weighted so heavily between the six and the 12 months. We're actually at 56%. Now, that is because we have seen the interest rates have risen. We wanted to try and protect the portfolio going forward, um, you know, from rates when they do finally um, come down but we have money plenty of money in the in the first three months of the year to meet the liquidity that may be required by you if we just go to the next slide i can 
this is the maturity graph um, and you can see that we have money coming up every single month it is weighted at the moment towards the june to august next uh, it says 28 actually meant to say 24 that was i don't know how that managed to it was on my phone originally about 24. the reason for that is because rates have got very very high in those longer periods and if you look at um, you won't see that the trustees will see the portfolio as it comes through every month actually from um, the end of june onwards well we managed for 12 month deposits to get over six percent in fact the highest rate we got was in august at 6.41 percent you know for a 12 month deposit now you know it was very difficult to argue about not putting money out for that long you know with the way the market has been going now in the last few weeks there's been lots of talk about whether base rates or what will happen whether they'll go up or they'll go down the market has been completely confused the bank of england at one point said no that you know we think we peaked then then the market started to think no it's going to go up and we have seen in September actually because and particularly today even that rates have dropped from those heights of 6.4 today we can only get 5.7 percent it's still a very very good rate um, and we can't you know obviously can't complain about that and that is locked in for the for the next 12 months now the interesting thing if you on the maturities the average um, maturity for the whole portfolio is now about 194 days which is you know obviously protecting the you know for people who've got long-term cash in there and that is you know quite important we we've, we've obviously it, it was difficult to decide whether rates are going to go up further we tr and if we go to the next slide actually this will help you we have managed to track base rate all the way up uh, with all these increases for the last 12 months now you know that is because we've had liquidity because we've been committed to saying right well, okay we're not sure whether where the peak is we've managed to actually track it keep it up and you know we're now in line with base rate in fact the portfolio is up above base rate it's um it's about 5.75 percent today so um i think we're quite generally quite pleased with that um you know it won't last we know that we know that rates will start coming down but because of the strategy we've had we we have maturities coming up every month and we will probably continue to place money out longer unless we're told that you need more liquidity just to protect it on the way down again um perhaps we just uh, go up to the next slide which is i think is will give you just show you how interest rates have moved over the last 12 months since we just you know if you can see that the one month rate was about two percent this time last year when we presented to you it's now five percent and the 12 month rate was about four percent but it's now actually just under six um when i did this graph it was actually up about six percent so i think you know we need to really you know, that just gives you a demonstration how the market has changed a lot um we have to be very careful where we place the money with there are less deposit takers now than there were before and the rates they pay really depend on two things the market they also what how much cash they need to match their own portfolios within the in the in the bank so sometimes we all get a higher rate from one bank than another bank because they need money up to 12 months or whatever it is to, to, to match their other maturities. So we, we look around at the market every time there's a maturity, we go around, we look at where we have room to place the money, we look at what rates they're paying, and then we decide whether we should retain it with who we have it at the moment or whether we will move it or we'll match split it. So there's, you know, it just it is has to move we have to move every time um to, to to make sure that we can try and maintain the best rate for the portfolio um 
I think that gives you know a good example of how the portfolio has moved because most people will forget what it was like 12 months ago and as so the previous um, graph showed how we've managed to track the portfolio and I'm sure most people have seen you know that their deposits have not been earning a lot um, for their personal deposits sometimes banks will pay a higher rate for individuals but not for corporates we've managed um, I think reasonably successfully to follow the corporate rate all the way or the the, the, the minimum rate the base rate going all the way up um, but just I'm sort of rushing through this a little bit but I'm welcome for questions we can go to the next slide I think these are the two next questions and I'm not <laughs> I don't know if I have the exact answer here at all in fact I know I haven't although I was asked on Wednesday whether I thought rates were going to go up and um, I did say no I didn't think we do and I think the other guys were going about 50 50 so um when will rates fall well actually no I can answer the second question first when will inflation fall inflation's falling already um we've seen that this week and we expect it to fall further uh, into next year you know some of the pay rises that went through for the public sector last year will come out of the equation you know by May or June next year so you, we will see a dramatic fall in inflation subject to you know that oil prices don't suddenly go up or food prices don't go up and I think you know as that happens then mortgage rates will probably come down um, which will help the inflation figure because the mortgage although they look at base rates they don't the packages they offered are, aren't always in line with base rates. So when will interest rates fall? Um, I, I suspect it won't be for six months. And then um, the speed, I am I can't be accurate, but I would say it will happen fairly regularly over the, between six and 12 months. And I think we've got to remember, and it was very different, in 2007 eight, we were at the same level of base rates. And, you know, within 12 months, we've gone down to 2%. I'm not saying that will happen again, but it could happen very, very rapidly. Um, uh, so that's why we're trying to keep the portfolio as long as possible so that you as investors will get the highest possible rate for as long as possible. I think that covers it. Um, you know, Chairman, I'm very happy to take questions if there are any, or if you'd like further explanation of anything. Thank you very much, Chris. That was very clear and uh, quite an encouraging presentation from you about the, what's happened with the deposit fund over the last 12 months. Now, at the moment, um, I'm not seeing any questions uh, on the Q&A facility. Um, I'm joined here in the church offices by, by June Lee, who's the executive officer of COSIT, and she's uh, monitoring the, the questions for us. Um, and uh, I've also got uh, Anne McIntosh, the general treasurer of the trust. Uh, you can't see either of them, but they're, they're sitting here uh, uh, in the room with me. Um, still no questions. Uh, I find it interesting, Chris, that last weekend, most uh, experts were predicting that this week we would see an increase in inflation and a further increase, I think the 15th consecutive increase in uh, Bank of England base rates. Yeah. And uh, uh, neither of those predictions proved to be correct. Um, so it uh, just illustrates how quickly things can change in, in the, 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 the world of finance. Yeah. Still no questions. A lot of these predictions are from people, obviously they're economists and you know, and I was one as well, but I would say that a lot of them don't see what's happening on the street. You know, they're just looking at the data. They're not out there talking to people. So they get slightly biased view. And, you know, I try to talk to people, see how, you know, um, I'm involved with a company in the Isle of Man and, and they, we know that the spend there has changed quite dramatically in the twi last 12 months. Um, for example, we, they own convenience stores and other things, but the convenience stores they used to, they've now seen that people don't go to Tesco's and do the huge shop anymore. They do a 
the basic shop and they top up during the week because their budgets can't afford to 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 do a big shop. So you know these sort of small things help, I, I believe, to come to a conclusion. Okay, well, thank you for your presentation, Chris. Uh, we still have no questions. So I, uh, on behalf of all of our investors, I'd like to thank you and Thomas Miller for all that you're doing. I found it encouraging in the last few quarters as we have uh, looked at the income we've received and the, what we're able to distribute to our investors. It has been encouraging to see quite uh, dramatic increases in the, the rates of interest that we've been able to, to distribute. So thank you very much. Thank and you we'll now much. move on to our second presentation. Our income fund is intended to provide a high and sustainable level of income. And we agree those levels between the trustees and the manager from time to time. And we also aim to protect the long term nominal value of capital. The fund is managed by Royal London Asset Management, and I'm pleased this morning to welcome Ewan McAlpine of Royal London, who will make his presentation. Over to you, Ewan. Good morning, um, Chairman. Can I just check, first of all, that you can hear me? Yes, thank you. you. Can. I good. can. Very good. I, I'll, I'll take that as everyone can hear me in that case. Yes, my name is Ewan McAlpine and I'm Investment Director for Fixed Income at Royal London Asset Management and responsible for the management of the portfolio that constitutes the Church of Scotland Investors Trust Income Fund. Turning to the first main slide, the portfolio is benchmarked. You can just turn to the next slide. There we go. The portfolio is benchmarked for the purposes of performance measurement and comparison against the IBOX Sterling Non Gilt Index, which essentially represents the main constituents of the UK corporate bond or credit or non government market. And the objective of the fund is to provide a high and sustainable level of income to investors in the fund. Royal London Asset Management has been managing this fund um, since 2012 and over the last 11 and a half years the underlying investors investments in the portfolio have changed uh, over time in agreement with the trustees to provide the best means of delivering the income that we try to produce. Currently, the portfolio is made up of three Royal London Asset Management bond funds. The Ethical Bond Fund, a largely investment grade fund that features an ethical screen. The fund may not invest in the bonds issued by companies that generate more than 10% of their turnover from any one or combination of a number of areas, alcohol, tobacco, armaments, gambling, pornography, and fossil fuels. Second, the Sterling Extra Yield Fund. It's a higher income fund that is focused on the sterling bond market, but less constrained than the ethical fund and doesn't have an ethical screen. And finally, the Global Bond Opportunities Fund, a more global version of the Sterling Extra Yield Fund, predominantly invested in non-sterling assets, but with a similarly higher um, income expectation than the ethical bond fund. Can turn to the next slide. The current level of investment or size of the portfolio is 76 million pounds, and this is predominantly held in the ethical bond fund, with the remainder split almost entirely evenly between the two higher income funds. Now moving to the next slide. In the very recent past and over the longer term, the benchmark performance, that of the market whose performance the portfolio is compared against, has been positive. And over all periods, the overall portfolio has outperformed this overall benchmark index. Notably, however, uh, market performance, so the benchmark performance over the last 12 months has been negative and total portfolio return has only been slightly positive in absolute terms. Now, if we can just turn to the next slide, I'd say that much of this negative um, market performance has been a result of 
the significant shift upwards in government bond yields that has gone hand in hand with the rise in base interest rates at the Bank of England. These have been rising since the end of 2021. And that's illustrated by the top two charts. You can see the level of gilt yields across the whole yield curve in August 2022 and August 2023. And you can sort of you know, get a real feel for the extent and the sharpness of that increase over the last couple of years on the top right hand chart. Now credit spreads, which are the additional um, amount of yield offered by corporate and non-government bonds, have also increased. This is the result of, um, well, the result of either or both of those increases, whether it's in the underlying government bond yield or in the additional level of yield you get from being invested in, in corporate bonds. They've both increased and they have both had a negative impact on the price of bonds. When yields rise, prices fall. However, since September last year, credit spreads have reduced or as we say, tightened fairly significantly, more so in some sectors than in others, so more so in financials and insurers um, than, than, than other sectors. And, and, and that has you know, changed um, the performance picture. If we turn to um, the next slide five, the extent of these, the impacts of these changes, yields, and in spreads can be seen on this chart of cumulative performance over the last few years. Government bonds have suffered a very significant negative impact over the last three years. Now it's worth saying that the trustees removed government bonds from the income fund strategy before this decline in performance. You know, that's a, that, that, that should be noted. So the fund became purely invested in corporate bonds after that time. But even corporate bonds or non-government bonds have, have performed negatively to some extent, less so than government bonds, but still negative. But I'm glad to be able to say that the, the Royal London funds that make up the income fund portfolio have all outperformed the credit um, benchmark index. So that credit benchmark index is shown by that teal line second from bottom. And the next one up from there is the performance of the ethical bond fund. The next one up from there is the global bond opportunities fund and the top one is the sterling extra yield fund. So in aggregate um, they've all added up to a performance to a positive performance over that period. So turning to the next slide number six. Although the fundamental economic backdrop of rising and high inflation and interest rates um, to the, that followed and low growth that um, accompanied all this at the same time, although they've continued from 2002, 22 into 2023, 2023 has benefited from the improved picture for the corporate bond sector. And the income fund that makes use of um, petitioning in sectors such as being overweight financial issues uh, and insurers, um, credit quality exposure such as an overweight to sub investment grade bonds which have outperformed over 2023 and security uh, which benefit from claims over assets or cash flows so that a bond will not completely um, fail if um, to, to, to deliver income um, if the bond defaults on its regular cash flows. It's also benefited from overweights to all these areas because all of these have outperformed. So turning to the next slide, number seven, a potentially, hopefully um, helpful and hopefully not too technical and complicated explanation of the fund's positioning is shown in this chart. It's a, a chart of the income yield of investments versus the duration. Now duration is simply an expression of the sensitivity of any fixed income investment or collection of investments such as in a fund or a benchmark index um, to movements in yield. So the change in price versus change in yield. The larger the duration, the more sensitive. And when interest rates or yields rise, then prices fall and vice versa. So while the bulk of the portfolio, that largest bubble on this chart, 
is invested in the ethical bond fund with a duration broadly similar to that of the benchmark index represented by that orange dot. The rest of the fund is invested in the sterling extra yield and the global bond opportunities funds that not only have a lower or shorter duration, but also generate a higher rate of income. The result, as shown by the little sort of teal colored dot on the, on the very edge of the, the purple, purple bubble, is a portfolio that has a lower duration or sensitivity to yield movements and a higher income yield. And both of these have helped the portfolio not only perform less negatively when the market has been moving negatively, but also outperform its benchmark index and result in, in, a, in a, an overall positive performance over the last year. Now turning to slide eight, one final thought before summing up, and this is on interest rates, although we've heard um, you know, what Chris Smith had to say about interest rates, which you know, I, I can't disagree with anything of at all. There's been a big question over how much further interest rates might rise. At the end of August, according to market pricing as illustrated by this chart here, and compared with previous August, in fact, um, there's been a big there's been a big change in expectations. Um, the market was suggesting at the end of August this year, one, possibly two more 0.25 percent interest rate rises by the Bank of England. But you can see that we're expecting yields to rise slightly and then start to decline again as we got into 2024. Yesterday, however, of course, that expectation changed. The Bank of England paused and market pricing now doesn't even price in one entire further rate rise at all. So it looks like things really have changed. So to sum up on the final slide, the key economic challenges remain, but the picture in terms of where bond yields go next seems to be clearing, seems to be becoming clearer at least. There is a risk that corporate bond markets could weaken, however, in an economic downturn, and that's one of the, the major risks that we are facing at the moment. Inflation may fall, but growth may fall further as well and take us into recession. In an economic downturn scenario like that, we need to be very wary of the parts of the credit market that we're invested in because there could be um, a, a, a negative influence on credit markets in the form of rising default rates. Generally, we feel that credit markets, certainly uh, investment grade investors, and this fund is largely investment grade, they're relatively well compensated. We would say overcompensated, in fact, for the default risks that they're likely to encounter. But the best way that we feel of continuing to generate returns is through a combined focus on income and security. And that is how the fund is invested with a focus on secured income in particular. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Of course, um, I'll hand back to the chairman um, for any questions that may arise. Thank you very much, Ewan. Um, we had a question about uh, the slides. Uh, there is a lot of information on the slides which you're seeing this morning. And uh, just like to confirm that from Monday of next week, uh, this uh, webinar will be available to watch on the same link that you've used today to participate. And all, all of the, the slides will be available there. Um, are there any further questions for the managers? Not seeing any. Um, last year, we were very pleased to be able to uh, show an increase in the, the level of income that we could distribute from this fund. Um, there had been a fall in the in the previous period. Uh, the, the increase last year was was significant. It, we we were able to distribute 18.75 percent more than we had done in the previous year. Um, it's too early to to give an exact figure for the current year. 
Um, but we're anticipating that there will be a further increase in the level of income, not at the level that we of every increase we saw in 2022, but uh, we anticipate there will be a further increase. And we plan to issue a bulletin to update investors uh, later this year, before the end of the year, and we'll, we'll try and be more specific then. We've got uh, a question. Um, June, would you like to read the question? And then Ewan can answer got a question and it states what criteria are used for the ethical fund? So the ethical criteria um, are fairly clearly set out in, in that um, before we're allowed to buy a bond um, for that fund, we must be satisfied that the company itself did not generate any more than 10% from any one or more of the various areas of business that I talked about. So alcohol, tobacco, uh, armaments, um, pornography um, and um, fossil fuel production, um, any one of those areas or a combination of those areas. You know, there are some uh, unlikely casualties, in fact, out there. Um, over time, we've had to not, for example, be able to invest the fund in the, the bonds of, of Tesco. Um, in combination, it actually generates more than 10% of its turnover from the sale of alcohol and tobacco. And so that fell foul of the uh, uh, of those criteria. It's perhaps a, you know, an unlikely casualty because it's not a pure alcohol production firm or even sales firm. Um, but when you put both of them in combination, then it falls foul. So it's not just pure play um, uh, companies that are affected by it. Okay, thank you for that uh, response, Ewan. Um, I don't see any further questions. Um, I, I should say that uh, um, one of the roles of the Ethical Oversight Committee will be to review with us the, the limits that, that are placed on exclusions such as that. Um, there is another question that has just popped up. June? investment fund performed worse than non-ethical. Is that a concern if the church wants to increase reliance on ethical? Um, I mean, I can answer that, but perhaps the chairman wants to mention something about it himself. Um, you know, I, I, I think there is a there is a, 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 a conception that if you're going to invest ethically or sustainably, then you're giving up opportunities. I think the last couple of years have shown that there there can be that sort of effect. For example, if you're prohibited from investing in in um, certain parts of the energy sector um, when energy prices are rising and energy companies are actually making a lot of profit and doing rather well, then not being able to invest in those companies is a hindrance to performance. Um, I think, however, I would say that the ethical criteria as applies to, to the fund um, because of the market that um, we're actually investing in, which is the corporate bond market, they have a fairly small impact on what we're able to invest in. You know, For example, there aren't that many uh, alcohol production companies who actually issue sterling bonds into the market that we miss out on being able to invest in. Um, and the same goes for the, the, the rest of the criteria, but they do have impacts and, you know, fossil fuels probably had the greatest impact than, than any of those, uh, any of those criteria. Thank you. And, and I would just add to that, that uh, the trustees are, are comfortable about the mix. Um, we are not surprised that the, the other funds uh, generate higher absolute returns that was that was part of our strategy in allowing the managers to to invest in those and uh, we're, we're comfortable uh, that the most significant holding that we have is in the ethical bond fund so uh, it's not something that gives us concern there's another question just popped up there's another two questions next question Will we or can we move towards a higher proportion of the higher return, shorter return bonds you highlighted? 
it's always something that we consider um, every year when we meet with the uh, the, 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 the the investment committee. Um, we uh, consider uh, the mix of investments and limits of investments. Um, currently, there is a limit, a lower limit that you know there is the important one I think on the extent to which the fund is invested in the ethical fund to maintain it as predominantly an ethically invested fund. However, and, and therefore the largest amount possible is currently invested in the two funds, but we and we have to decide whether there will be a, a point at which we move more into one or other of those higher yielding funds. I, I think, however, um, lowering that uh, minimum extent, um, increasing the amount that we would be able to invest in the higher yielding funds is going to be a question for the, the trustee themselves. Okay, thank you, Ewan. And next question. Next question. In view of Bank of England holding rate rises and the resultant change of expectations, do you expect to increase duration and possibly return to investing in gilts? It's a very good question. We should never forget about the attractiveness of the government bond market and in particular the uh, the extended duration that's available from it. You know, going uh, if you if you recall the bubble chart, um, there was um, a mark on that chart showing the average duration and income yield of the government bond market, the government bond index, just for reference. It is a, a far longer duration, but a much lower income yield um, than the corporate bond market. Nevertheless, even though it is a lower yield, uh, the, the performance that could be generated by investing longer duration via the, the government bond market could be of use. However, we do actively manage the duration of the underlying um, funds that we invest in. And very recently we've slightly adjusted their duration to be a little bit longer than it was. We've gone from being slightly short versus the benchmark index in the ethical bond fund to being slightly long duration. And, and that was a decision that was led by, in fact, our government bond investment team who changed their view that government bonds actually represented, government bond yields actually represented good value after they, they, they went beyond four and a half percent. So as a house, we're actually now, uh, we now take a, a longer duration view. Hey, thank you very much, Ewan. Um, that appears to be all the questions uh, for uh, Ewan and uh, Royal London. Thank you for your presentation. And uh, we'll now move on to the final presentation of the morning, which is about our growth fund. The growth fund is pre invested predominantly in global equities, but the managers can also invest in fixed income bonds, in alternative assets, in property, and in cash. The trustees have agreed a benchmark with the managers and the current investment target is that the portfolio will outperform this target by 1% per annum. We aim to deliver growth in capital values while also distributing an element of income each year. The fund is managed by Newton Investment Management and I'm very pleased to invite uh, David Moylet and Bavan Shah to make their presentation to us this morning. Uh, good morning, Chairman, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm David, as uh, the Chairman mentioned. I am the Client Relationship Manager for the COSID arrangement, and I'm joined today by Bavan, Bavan Shah, who actually is the Portfolio Manager for the arrangement for the portfolio. Could we move on to page three, please? So what we're showing you here is a quick overview of the uh, portfolio that we're managing for you and the mandate. This has very much got a growth focus. Um, you've talked about restrictions in some of the other sec uh, sections this morning. The restrictions on in terms of the areas that we cannot invest in include armaments, alcohol, gambling, tobacco, uh, coal, shale gas, tar sands, and recreational cannabis. While we can in theory invest 
in oil and gas companies, we have chosen not to do that on investment grounds. Looking at the portfolio itself, uh, it, at the end of June, it was valued at just shy of £315 million. That value is pretty much there, the same as we look today. I mentioned that there's a growth focus on this particular mandate. Um, if you look at the benchmark, 75% uh, of it is invested in equities. 10% is invested in bonds. You've heard a lot about bonds this morning. The bond element of the benchmark is high yield bonds. So the more racy end of that particular spectrum. We can also invest in alternatives, which really cover things like renewable energy, energy storage, uh, infrastructure, and in our case, music royalties. There's also property, a 5% allocation and a cash allocation to the benchmark of 2%. From a Newton perspective, uh, we are pretty concerned about the economic and market environment. We think it's pretty challenging and we think it's likely to remain difficult for some time. From a practical perspective, looking at the how we're positioned relative to the benchmark, as I mentioned, we're underweight in equities. Uh, for the bond portion, the benchmark uh, is in high yield bonds. We're overweight in bonds, but not in high yield. We are choosing uh, to be a little bit more cautious than that. We're also uh, underweight in alternatives. Alternatives, typically you will be in investing in these because they pay very good income, but if you can get pretty good income on deposit and other areas of the market, they may tend to struggle, which is hence our underweight position. And we're overweight in cash, so that tells you a lot. Cash rates at the moment, we're earning uh, north of 5% on that, and that's pretty easy for us from our perspective. It's an easy decision to make. So our starting position from in terms of the portfolio positioning is that we are cautiously positioned and we'll talk you through some of the reasons for that in a moment. Looking at um, moving on to the next slide. Here are some of the factors that were taken into account in terms of the market and economic background. You've heard a lot about inflation um, in the earlier sessions. Uh, in the UK, uh, uh, in, obviously there was a better than expected inflation posting yesterday. Inflation came in at 6.7% versus a 68 that was expected. The reality of the situation, and obviously as a consequence of that, uh, the Bank of England decided to pause uh, in terms of a potential interest rate increase. If you look at interest rates around the world, in the UK you have had 14 interest rate increases. In the US, you've had 11 uh, interest rate increases. In Europe, you've had 10 interest rate increases. Each of the central banks in those areas have paused on interest rate increases in the last week or so. Now, from a practical perspective, if you look at the UK uh, inflation number, yes, it was a little bit better than expected, but it is a long, long way uh, at 6.7% above the 2% target that the Bank of England has set. Secondly, if you sort of uh, dig into the weeds of yesterday's interest rate uh, announcement, uh, the Bank of England committee has nine people on it. Uh, five of them voted to pause in terms of an interest rate increases. Uh, four of them said we should be putting them up. So basically what we're saying really from a practical perspective is that we expect interest rates to remain uh, higher for longer. I think the Bank of England yesterday, you guys in uh, Scotland know all about your Monroe's. So if we were to use a, a mountain analogy, uh, the interest rate trajectory in the UK is not like Everest where you get to the top and come down as quickly as possible. It's more likely to be like Table Mountain where it, it's a painful getting to the top, but you stay up there for a while. So essentially uh, our view from a Newton perspective is that interest rates are likely to remain higher for longer. The consequence of that from an economic perspective is that we're all from a day to day perspective uh, aware of the cost of living prices in terms of food prices, energy prices, uh, rents, mortgages, etc. That is likely to remain uh, a challenge from an economic perspective for some time to come. You may be aware that if you look at the UK, just staying local um, in terms of mortgage rates, uh, yes, they've come down a little bit over the last sort of uh, 24 to, uh, hours or the last week or so. But from a practical perspective, 
in the UK, uh, there is a significant proportion of the population who have mortgages are on fixed mortgages. In 2023, something in the region of 1.4 million uh, mo fixed mortgages will expire, which were set at rates below 2%. So really what we're saying is that once you go to remortgage after that, you're going to have a lot less money in your pocket than you have become used to. So from a practical perspective, we believe that the consumer is likely to remain under pressure for a significant period of time. And you may have seen it over the last few days or so, uh, where in Russia uh, they have uh, really placed a ban on exporting um, diesel and petrol. So that's going to impact on energy prices as well going into the future. So the economic outlook is pretty challenged. Um, that's just not just in the UK, uh, that is pretty much across the world. The other concern that we've got is that through the uh, credit crisis over the last 10 years or so, when the developed economy was really struggling, China was booming. If you look at the Chinese economy now, uh, the Chinese economy, 30% of the economic growth has been coming from the property sector. The property sector has pretty much collapsed in China. Uh, secondly, youth unemployment is running at something in the region of 20%. In fact, the youth unemployment numbers were getting so bad uh, that they've stopped reporting them. So really what we're saying is if you look at the developed economies, uh, the consumer is likely to remain under pressure for some time. And if you look at, uh, at the developing economies, China, which has been the growth engine for the world economy over the last sort of 10 years or so, is faltering very badly. So really what we're saying to you is that um, we think the environment is likely to be fairly challenged and interest rates are likely to remain relatively high until, until such time as either inflation comes down fairly significantly or the economy starts to go into free fall. Neither of those are going to be a, a, a pleasant environment. In terms of the market background, moving on to the next slide, what we're showing you here on the left hand side is looking back over the last 10 years, the returns on regional equity markets. So the US market has clearly been the leading market over that period of time. More short term, if we look at the right hand side, what we're doing is we're breaking down uh, the equity and bond markets into their various component parts. You'll have heard that it's been a fairly difficult period for bond markets and you're seeing that coming through on the top there where all of the major bond markets have produced negative performance. Equity markets have done a little bit better but what this actually hides is that within equity markets, the leadership has been pretty narrow. Number one, I, a handful of uh, stocks have been responsible for a, a large portion of the, their performance. And secondly, within that, there has been a significant rotation in the returns on the various industrial sectors. So if you move on to the next slide, what we're showing you here is we're breaking down the world equity market into the various industrial sectors. And on the left hand side, what we're showing you is calendar uh, 2022. And on the right hand side, what's happened in the last six months, i.e. the first half of calendar 2023. And what you'll see here is that if you look at 2022, you'll see that uh, energy and utilities, which were the top performers, uh, were pretty much towards and consumer staples were pretty much towards the bottom of that and healthcare uh, in uh, 2023. The two worst performing sectors last year, technology and consumer discretionary, have been the leaders this year. Now, this is the sort of rotations that makes it very, very difficult for a long term portfolio manager. Now, if you look at and, and just to sort of give you a little bit more color around that, uh, if you look at 2022, the technology sector had, was the worst performing sector because uh, typically these companies do not pay dividends and they have very strong growth numbers coming through. But if interest rates are going up and you can get five, five and a half percent on deposit or in short dated bonds, the technology sector the, uh, is going to look a little bit more challenged relative to that. If you look at 2023, even though interest rates have gone up, uh, and bond yields have obviously uh, come down, i.e. bonds have performed a little bit better this year. What's been driving the technology sector is the focus 
on uh, artificial intelligence and anything related to artificial intelligence uh, has been going through the roof. So if you look at the market leadership there this year, uh, pretty much seven stocks within the tech sector or artificial intelligence related have generated all of the performance. As, as you can see further down that table on the right hand side of page six, what you're seeing is that most sectors has really struggled in calendar 2023. So the background, as I say, has been pretty uh, challenging. From a Newton perspective, uh, we think it's likely to remain that way, and therefore we've positioned the portfolio fairly cautiously. How has that impacted on performance? If we look at page seven, what we're showing you here is looking at the performance uh, to the end of June, uh, and we're showing six months, one year, three years, five years, etc. The blue bar here is the performance of the uh, uh, COSIC fund. So first half of this year up 6%, uh, your benchmark is up 6.7. 12 month number, bench, uh, we are up 6.2%, uh, benchmark up 9.2%, so well behind the benchmark. Why is that? It's primarily because we've been cautiously positioned. It, uh, is the first, and there are really two sort of factors that have led to this uh, differential within the benchmark. The first one is the fact that the bond benchmark is in high yield bonds. We are concerned about the uh, global economic outlook. So from as a consequence of that, we think high yield bonds uh, may struggle if the economy across the world goes into free fall. The second element is that the alternatives are benchmarked against inflation plus 2%. The alternatives themselves have struggled, but clearly inflation plus 2% has been an extremely difficult target to chase, and it's not something that we feel would be right to do in terms of the interests of the underlying investors. So the benchmark has been pretty challenging this year, but to put some context around that, the green bar that we've put in here, it gives you an indication as to how the fund has done relative to its peer group in the charity sector, the ARC Steady Growth Index. So while we have not kept pace with the index and we've been cautiously positioned, we've significantly outperformed the average equivalent charity over pretty much all periods. So while it's disappointing to be behind the benchmark, we feel it's right not to chase uh, heady markets against a very difficult background. Uh, but what, what we can console ourselves and hope for yourselves with is the fact that we've done relatively well versus the other average charity. And moving on to the next slide. Again, this is comparing you with the average charity. Not alone have you done relatively well versus the average charity. You've also done well relative to the top upper quartile. So performance relative to the peer group has been pretty good, albeit that it's been disappointing to be behind the benchmark. But we do not think it's appropriate to chase uh, some of the benchmark returns by taking too much risk at this particular point in the economic cycle. I'll now pass across to Bavin just to talk you through the portfolio positions relatively quickly. Bavin. We move on to the next slide. So as David's mentioned, we've got a fairly cautious and defensive stance given all the headwinds that we're seeing in the markets at the moment. Uh, against that backdrop, as David has shown you, we are underweight equities and we're underweight alternatives. We think cash at giving you 5%, given, given some of the situations that we're seeing at the moment, is a good alternative. And what that does is it also gives us the optionality when we start seeing wobbles in the market to, to introduce securities into the portfolio that we like for the long term. Within the sector mix of the equities that we own, we prefer more defensive sectors, so sectors that are less reliant on the economic cycle. So areas such as healthcare end up being an overweight, utilities where we think continuous spending needs to continuously happen so especially within the utility sector we're expecting good returns to come through as we start looking for more investments into um, reducing our use of fossil fuels into the grid and this is also another area that is benefiting so within the industrial sector where you see the largest overweight of the portfolio this is very much driven from a stock specific basis we continue to like companies that are benefiting from some of the infrastructure spend that we need to continue to see. So if you if you remember one of David's previous slides, he talked about an increasing level of geopolitical risk into the portfolios. 
what that's leading to is a reshoring of many industries, both in the US and Europe. So that leads to a number, an increase in fiscal spend that happens into some of these areas. Another fact that we're seeing is we all know we need to decarbonize our industries. And as a result of that, there is a lot of expenditure that is going into businesses that are helping to electrify the grid. And that all, a number of these companies are benefiting from fiscal policies in the United States, such as the Inflation Reduction Act. So, and we have a number of these companies in the portfolio that we continue to believe in for the long term. Dave's already mentioned our, our stance on fixed income, so you can see that we have an overweight to bonds. Now, I'd like to emphasize that these are actually very short dated, actually probably more cash like within their portfolios. Again, very defensively positioned versus the benchmark, which is a high yield bond index. So as was mentioned earlier, we are concerned about a recession and we don't think with credit spreads today, we are being compensated for the additional risk that we need to take. So given that, um, we think it's really important to stay defensively positioned um, into the market. Um, we've talked about that this is a growth portfolio and whilst it doesn't have an income target that in this current environment we think income is going to be a really important part of total returns and as if we move to the next slide it's in, what we can show here is since the pandemic where we saw a drop in income it's pleasing to see that the portfolio is starting to rise in income and actually we're coming back to levels close to what we saw pre-pandemic um, uh, for this year so we're pleased to see that Finally, before we open it up for questions, I wanted to highlight the importance on the next slide of not only investing, but being active stewards of your capital. And what you see on this slide is our key engagement themes that we want to focus on this year. So we all know the importance of managing climate change. So we're engaging on companies on their net zero ambitions. Alongside that, we think it's really important to focus also on biodiversity, workforce engagement and supply chain and human rights. So we want to ensure that the companies that we are, 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 are invested in are managing and treating their supply chains and employees in, in, in good ways. Alongside that, governance is really important for total returns for clients, so we're focusing on board accountability. We'd be very happy to take any questions on that. Uh, we uh, hopefully weren't too gloomy, but we do think the environment is it's fairly difficult at this particular point in time, and it's appropriate to position the portfolio accordingly. Thank you very much. Thank you, David and, and Bavan. Um, the word challenging does appear uh, a number of times in your presentation, but it's a bit similar to what the Governor of the Bank of England said yesterday when he said there was no room for complacency. Now, we've got a number of questions, um, uh, one about uh, uh, infrastructure and property. Would you like to deal with that first, June? The question is, do you think infrastructure and property fund falls have been overdone? So um, they have they have fallen back significantly and actually a number of the investments that we're seeing today are actually now um, trading below their net asset value. So we invest in these vehicles through investment trusts that are, are, are liquid vehicles that mark to market capital. The reason they have fallen primarily is one of two reasons. One, interest rates have risen and therefore actually in a number of investors that were in this sector um, were holding them instead of government bonds. Now, now there is an alternative, so that is driving that. There has also been some technical reasons um, within the market due to how they are accounted for um, within market. So there are a number of sellers within the market within that. So we actually now think they are offering a lot of value within the market, um, and we think there will be opportunities to add to the sector as as as, as we go forward. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll deal with the next question, which has been raised by John. Um, each of the managers have given us in their presentations uh, comparative performance figures. Uh, the, the growth and income funds are measured against benchmarks. So you, you will see uh, if you look back at the slides, which are going to be available um, from beginning of next week, if you come back onto this link. Um, the, with the deposit fund, it's not uh, measured against the benchmark, but you'll see from the manager's presentation that uh, you've got information about the return on the deposit fund relative to base rates. So hopefully that information is, is all there for you, John. Um, 
legally, we as trustees cannot advise our investors which fund is best for their needs. Um, but if you look on the website, the COSIT part of the website, there is a brief description of, of the intention of each of our funds. Uh, so, for example, the deposit fund is intended for short term cash deposits. Uh, income fund is intended for those investors who are looking for good levels of income while protecting capital value over the long term. And the growth fund is, is, is intended to provide growth with an element of income. So um, other than saying that, um, I'm sorry, I can't answer the question about which is the best option for, for your church as an investor, but hopefully you'll, you'll get enough information from, from what I've just said and from the, the website. Um, there's a question about Japan, Jean. Yes. Um, next question is, what is your view of the outlook for Japan? So we, we, we do not invest specifically in countries. We're trying to find the best companies globally um, within our portfolio. So our, our portfolios are very much bottom up stock picking companies. Um, I think it's, it, it's an interesting, important factor here within Japan is actually the big difference we've seen today is the rise in yields and, and bond yields, and that clearly has an impact on currency. Um, so the exporters in the in the recent past have benefited from a weakening of the Japanese yen. Um, if we were to see interest rates continue to rise and bond yields rise within Japan, you could see um, an increase in the currency in Japan, which would be a negative um, headwind for for um, Japanese exporters. Um, we continue to focus on this as a part of our investment thesis, um, but we do not necessarily have a specific country view on Japan. Yeah, essentially we're looking to invest in the best uh, companies around the world. So if the best one in a particular segment is in Japan, we will go for it. But typically, it's it, the companies that we're investing in are going to be global in nature anyway, so it's it's not going to be local driven. Okay, thank you. Uh, now the question about uh, the ARC indices. Yes, next question is why is ARC lower? Because they have been even more cautious. No, it's it, either the returns that they've generated have been lower. Um, I'm not sure what the peer group is doing. I can, what I, all I can tell you is what we're doing has been cautiously positioned. So despite that, we still managed to outperform the peer group. So I would hope that the investors would be able to take some comfort from that, that uh, it's not a case of trying to chase uh, returns. It's a case of trying to protect you in the current environment. But despite that, the performance has been pretty OK and the income has been growing. So. I'd like to hope that that will be seen as a sort of a, a suitably appropriate outcome in the environment that we're operating in. The, the trustees are aware that the benchmark which we have set for the growth fund managers is quite a challenging benchmark, particularly the, the, the element which is relating to alternatives where we set a, a, a uh, benchmark of inflation plus two percent and when inflation was double figures that was a really really challenging uh, uh, target to meet so we're aware of that but we do say, take some comfort when we see the figures comparing our performance with that of uh, other charity investors so it's helpful for us to see that information while we don't know what the other charity investors are doing and the final question that I see on the screen, I'm going to ask June to answer. What is PPU? PPU is pence per unit. So we, we use that terminology. Each of our funds is is unitized, and we use the 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 terminology uh, to explain uh, pence per unit. I don't see any further questions. So um, at this stage, I'd like to to thank David and Bavin for their presentation on the growth fund and uh, just to make a number of uh, summary uh, remarks um, we've heard from each of the fund managers today uh, i think it's it's useful to get an update uh, direct from the horse's mouth as it were and it's been useful also to have the questions that have been raised i'd like to thank all of the managers who have presented this morning 
Uh, I'd like to thank Neil, who has provided technical support here at One to One George Street. Uh, June and Anne, who've uh, provided uh, support uh, to, to me. And finally, I'd like to thank you for participating this morning. Um, we've had a good number of people participating, um, both people who are currently investing in, in our funds and people who might not yet be investing because the invitation went out to uh, a wide range of people. Um, as I said earlier, we plan to issue an update bulletin before the end of the year, and that will give a better indication of the likely levels of income from each of our three funds this year. And finally, I'd like to say that uh, we will shortly be inviting uh, expressions of interest from anyone who would like to, to join the COSIT Board of Trustees. Uh, we've, we've had some retirements recently, and uh, we're always looking for uh, new people to participate in our work. It's really interesting work. Uh, you don't need to have a background in investment management. We've got a broad range of uh, people skills on, on the board at the moment. We plan to advertise in life and work in, in the coming months and uh, we'll also make an announcement on our website. So if it's an area that you think you might be interested in, then please let us know. And with that, I'd like to uh, close the, the, the webinar and thank everyone for their participation.